Hi, I'm Logan, and along with Emily, Sam, Jose, and Cam, we run KWVS, the student radio station on campus. KWVS has been on the air since the 60s and proudly continues to broadcast 24-7 at kwvsradio.com. If you love music, want to DJ, produce a podcast, or just want to be eligible to win some sick concert tickets, honey was a blast. KWVS is your new home. From music, sports, politics, and even a podcast dedicated completely to reviewing Saturday Night Live, if you can think of an idea, you can make it a reality. We're so excited for this upcoming year, and in the meantime, you can link with us at kwvsradio.com and kwvsradio on Instagram. See you soon. A year like no other. A worldwide health catastrophe. Growing racial tensions throughout the nation. No justice! No peace! No racist! Police! a new administration in the White House. People of this nation have spoken. They've delivered us a clear victory. A growing number of mass shootings. A homeless crisis and a push to recall the governor in California. And technology takes off. Three, two, one, zero. After the year that locked us in and forced us to look within and beyond, It is time to change. Welcome to this special edition of News Waves from the Pepperdine campus in Malibu. I'm Brianna Willis. I'm Christina Stratton. While the past year has kept most of us in our homes, it's forced us to no longer ignore certain issues. And with what we know, we know we can never go back to the way things were. It is time to change. I'm TJ Barnholtz. During the first half of the show, we'll take you through a number of issues that came to light this past year and what needs to change. And in the second half, we'll show you possible solutions and hope for what the future looks like. Three, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Dante Wright, Micaiah Bryant. The list goes on and on. Those are only four people who have been murdered by law enforcement over the past year. But problems of racial tension within the black community also have roots at Pepperdine. I say names like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Dante Wright now, Micaiah Bryant now. Um, The list, unfortunately, goes on and on. What comes up for you when you hear these names? I feel great pain when I see those images. I am vexed to my core. And for Black individuals across the nation, this pain and suffering has always been a reality. When we see the blue lights in our um, rearview mirror, it, it, it's not a sign of help. For others, with the events captured on camera this past year, they were forced to see and confront the long and ugly history of racial injustice. People could not live life at their leisure. They couldn't do the things that they normally do to block out you know, what's happening in real life. Whereas Black people, we know that this has already been happening. For Pepperdine students like Kinsey Bashara, the injustice hits close to home, having experienced it firsthand. I had a police officer hold a gun to me for no reason when I got pulled over and I was asked to give my license and registration. So I reached into my pocket to grab my wallet with my license. And all of a sudden, it's hands on a dash, hands on a dash, and a gun pointed to me. Kinsey represents the fear among black men in America. I've been face to face with that experience before. Uh, it's scary. But I think the even scarier part about it is that I wouldn't be surprised if that were to be how I'd go down. And over the past year, while the world continued to address racism towards Black Americans, a top Pepperdine administrator, Pete Peterson, emailed what some say is racist propaganda about the 1619 Project. Universities all too often are complicit in both maintaining and legitimizing white supremacy in the everyday experiences of the curriculum. And Branch says, It's time for Pepperdine to change its story. Today, right with everything that's going on, Pepperdine has to confront its racist past and how that directly plays a part in the current racism that exists today. Coming up in the second half, I sit down with activists to discuss ways we can continue to create change for the Black community and fight for guilty verdicts like the nation saw with Derek Chauvin. Since the coronavirus first appeared in Wuhan, China, Asian hate crimes have spiked across the world. Rihanna Dazan spoke with members of the Pepperdine community about their perceptions and own experiences with the rising hate. Rihanna? Thanks, Christina. Asian hate has risen during the pandemic. 
and the people I talked with hold former President Trump responsible. There are two different viruses running through our country, the coronavirus and the racism virus. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China. A racist link between the coronavirus and Asian Americans has caused a disturbing spike in hate crimes over the past year. Back in March, a shooting at a massage parlor in Atlanta killed six Asian women. It definitely uh, brings up a great deal of concern. The Stop AAPI hate group cites over 3,700 incidences of hate against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders during the pandemic. Asian Americans, like Pepperdine Jr. Serena Woon, are not just fearing for their health, but also for the safety of their older family members. Like my mom, she asked me a couple weeks ago, like, can you come to the bank with me? Um, because she was just afraid to go by herself. Um, and she's not like an elderly woman. She's, you know, my mom. But um, it's just been really hard. A silent symptom of this pandemic has been the anti-China rhetoric fueled by statements by former President Donald Trump, who refers to COVID-19 as the Chinese virus or the Kung flu. He, his labeling uh, definitely played into um, the political right uh, uh, into his political supporters. I, I, I think, uh, you know, many, probably most, of his supporters, you know, um, would nod their head and say, yeah, yeah, right? I mean, um, you know, so, so um, uh, you know, anti-Chinese sentiments, right, uh, have existed for a long time. Asian Americans say that racism is nothing new, though. They've been experiencing it since long before the coronavirus pandemic brought it into the national spotlight. It's just extremely racist, and it just gives people who already have inside them this like prejudice towards other people, it just gives them the excuse to outwardly act on that prejudice. Change, it starts with the language we use. Coming up in the second half of the show, I'll tell you what some Asian Americans say is needed to stop these kinds of actions and provide better support for them. From being the worst state in the country for COVID-19 to now the best, California faced a lot of restrictions and change this year, putting the state's leader under fire. Miles Campbell joins us with more. With stunning sights and beautiful weather, California is known as a dream state. But when COVID hit, some say living in California turned into a bad dream. And Californians became even more divided over state leadership. California Governor Gavin Newsom has been no stranger to tough tasks throughout his term as governor. From wildfires, racial inequality issues, and the coronavirus, Newsom's leadership has been nationally recognized for better or for worse. He, I think he definitely deserves a bit of scrutiny um, and a bit of a closer look at some of the effects that his policy has had on your everyday California citizens. On March 20th, 2020, California became the first state to entirely lock down. The restrictions took effect when California had only 900 confirmed cases and 19 deaths. Newsom's strict handling of the coronavirus in California left many citizens either greatly appreciative of the governor's initiatives but plenty of others were upset with the mandated restrictions. I think discussing specifically his reaction to the COVID situation in the past year was probably the best in the country. In the midst of his strict state regulations, Newsom fell under fire after being spotted attending a dinner party that broke his COVID protocols. The fact that he's not willing to follow his own rules proves to me and proves to I know a lot of people in California that these lockdowns are about more than keeping people safe. They're about power and they're about him having the ability to exercise power. Within the past year, 135,000 more people left the state than moved to the state. So the question is, does Newsom still have enough power to retain his position? A lot has changed for the governor this past year. Overall, his approval rating is still at 53%, but that's down from its peak of 65% last May. In the next half, I'll explain the recall effort against him. During his campaign for governor, Newsom promised to tackle California's homeless crisis. But as the pandemic raged on, the crisis across the state, and especially in Los Angeles County, got even worse. Reporter Kayla Mendez takes us into the life of one person living on the streets in Malibu. Thanks, Bree. People wait along this stretch of land here for volunteers to hand out grab-and-go lunches. I talked to one of these people, Mark, who is a recent newcomer to Malibu and hopes to get off the streets soon. 
Hello, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, how are you doing? I've had these dogs 10 and 11 years. And uh, of course, I ain't been on the streets that long. I've only been on the streets uh, maybe 11 months, I think. I came from Arizona. That's where I started the homeless journey from was in Arizona. So I just came here and this is where I'm at. We've been providing uh, food, uh, lunches, and dinners as often as we can for about six years. So mental health services are also provided out here. They just brought me medication today, as a matter of fact. It's not only the lack of affordable housing. That is a big part of it. But what I've seen on the streets, a big part of it is mental illness and, and drug use. And that is not because these people are bad. It is because there's so much trauma that caused it. And I've been diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar, PTSD. I got major anger issues, depression. Um, that's pretty much it. Hey, how are you? We serve somewhere between 20 and 30 people on any given day. They stay with us for a while, they move on, they get housed. Well, most of them do. We'll never go to the house again. They, they choose this lifestyle. It's, they choose it. I'm going off these fucking streets. This shit sucks. Kaylin, what other organizations are providing assistance to Malibu's homeless population? Yes, Bree. CART and an outreach organization called the People of Concern provide medical check-ins, housing assistance, COVID vaccines and testing, clothing, soaps, and toothbrushes for all the homeless. Back to you on campus. Thanks, Kaylin. Last week, President Joe Biden officially marked the 100th day of his presidency. Christian Parham joins us to document the president's efforts to reshape policy in a deeply divided nation. Christian? Thanks, TJ. 100 days is an important milestone for any president. Biden, the 46th president of the United States, entered the White House with an aggressive agenda. His presidency, though, has not been problem-free, including a surge of migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border. But let's look at where he's made progress so far. After just 100 days, I can report to the nation, America is on the move again. In President Biden's first 100 days, he signed 11 bills into laws and 42 executive orders. When I took office, I uh, decided that uh, it was a fairly basic, simple proposition. And that is, I got elected to solve problems. Some of these orders included lifting the ban on transgender people in the military, rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement and World Health Organization, and reversing the deportation on Dreamer immigrants. After signing these executive orders, Biden set to address his next campaign promise, the American Rescue Plan. American Rescue Plan that will tackle the pandemic and get direct financial assistance and relief to Americans who need it the most. This plan promised to give eligible Americans stimulus checks, get 200 million Americans vaccinated, and help reopen schools. Biden delivered his vaccine promise. Over 200 million shots. We're saving lives. Biden also made foreign policy strides in the Middle East. He is the first president to recognize the Armenian genocide. He also promised to remove all troops from Afghanistan by September 1st. But Republicans say it is important to give credit to former President Trump for what has been accomplished. I think on every metric that you could go on, you can see that the president did uh, a lot to give the Biden administration uh, some good things that they could continue to do. Polls show strong support for the president's handling of the coronavirus, but only 52% of adults approve of his job overall. I'll be back to tell you what both sides, conservatives and liberals, say is needed to keep moving forward. One of the major issues President Biden is facing is gun violence. This year alone, there has been nearly one mass shooting per day. And for Pepperdine students, gun violence is something they know all too well. Liza Equibias joins us with this. Liza? Thanks, Christina. We talked with one Pepperdine student who lived through the borderline mass shooting and says the rise in gun violence is traumatic and it's time to change. Atlanta, eight people killed. Boulder, Colorado, 10 people killed. Orange, California, four people killed. Indianapolis, eight people killed. 
It may feel like America entered a new wave of gun violence in 2021, but a review of shootings with multiple victims shows that their frequency has been unusually high for more than a year. Shootings cause other shootings. Like People are inspired by these horrible people who do these things. Data from the Gun Violence Archive shows that the number of multiple victim shootings first spiked in April 2020 and has stayed high since. For members of the Pepperdine community, the violence hits home. Like any loud noises, any sudden noises, even sudden movement, all kind of sets me on edge. Alicia Yu was at the Borderline Bar and Grill when a shooter took the life of her sweetmate, Elena Housley, and 11 others. Yu, like many others, says it is time for leaders to take action. Like, I would love to see politicians care um, because, yeah, it's the whole, like, thoughts and prayers thing for a day or two, and then they've moved on. Some students, like senior Cameron Gordon, are feeling the weight of these emotionally charged conversations. But then you think about it in the grand scheme of things, and it's so sad that we have to fight for something that is, it's like human life, or it's not. It's hard to argue that you don't want to end gun violence in America. Coming up in the second half, we hear responses from both sides about President Biden's movement for gun control. Bree, back to you. With all that has happened, this year was the year it became okay to not be okay. With the fear of the unknown, Abby Wilt joins us to explain how COVID took mental health to an even darker place on Pepperdine's campus. Thanks, Bree. The struggles faced are universal. Even people who had not struggled with mental health before did this year. Isolated, lonely, grief. It's extremely stressful. These are the feelings brought by COVID. It's kind of become the norm to be sad. When the pandemic started, many people thought it would soon be over. But month after month, as events continued to get canceled, people started to feel hopeless. There's no end date to look forward to. It just feels like it'll never end. Many people noticed their mental health declining, even if they hadn't struggled with mental health before. There's no way to go through quarantine and COVID and like being displaced and just the way that COVID has messed with so many different parts of people's like day-to-day -day lives and not have higher anxiety. And still most students are not themselves. You know, everyone's just a little bit more down, a little bit lonelier, sometimes more anxious. At Pepperdine, the number of students accessing the counseling center and seeking for help increased to even higher numbers. And we can track how many students are feeling anxious, depressed, suicidal, etc. It's going up, up, up. Even as campus is starting to reopen and there is hope for next year, with so much already lost, it has not been easy to regain hope. It's hard to stay optimistic because you just it's just so unpredictable. The long-term repercussions of this time are still unknown, but one mental health professional says the next few months will be critical for people's healing. I'll be back in the second half of the show with that. Christina, back to you. In addition to changes in mental health, when the pandemic hit last year, wearing a mask, taking temperatures, and a number of COVID social health practices quickly became the new normal. Christina Burovtova and Tanya Yarian have more on how Pepperdine students adjusted to these routines. Thank you, Christina. More than a year into the pandemic, many have become accustomed to the required health practices. And from our reporting, we learned that some students now can't imagine life without them in place. When the novel coronavirus hit the U.S., people learned novel social health practices, from self-quarantining to social distancing to mask wearing. Now more than a year later, Pepperdine students, like first-year student Rufus Florin, say these practices are routine. And now it's like you don't leave the house without your mask. It's just, it became second nature in like a forceful but subtle way, I think. With these practices in place, Many, like first-year student Emily Torrance, find it hard to recall a time without COVID-19 regulations. I honestly can't even remember life without masks at this point. Like, it's so crazy to look back at pictures from a while ago and see myself at concerts or airplanes without a mask on. Almost all aspects of how we do things like traveling look different. But Florin, who has traveled to six countries during the pandemic, hopes some of these changes stick. I've been blessed enough to travel quite a lot during the pandemic, responsibly, of course. Um, so it's been a lot of, you know, empty rows of uh, airplane seats, which I've enjoyed. And I'm hoping it may continue to look that way. 
Fully vaccinated people now do not need to get tested or self-quarantine when traveling, and other restrictions in L.A. County also continue to be lifted as cases drop. But for some, like senior Kat Chang, the requirement for social interaction is hearing I'm negative. I do go out with people only if they're COVID negative. No, I don't go to events or parties. And like, I don't associate with myself with anyone who does that just because I feel like it's extremely insensitive. For Florence, seeing how much health and social habits changed in a year also has changed his mindset. Everyone has learned from the pandemic is not to take anything for granted and definitely not to, you know, kind of like rely on a comfortable future just because you don't know what is going to happen next. Last week, the CDC announced that fully vaccinated people no longer need to wear masks outdoors, except when they're in crowds. Tanya, what do you think? It is going to feel weird without one. Coming up, we talk with other members of the Pepperdine community about how some other social health practices we adopted over last year may be here to stay, even after the pandemic. Since most people cannot meet in person this year, Technology saved us by allowing us to still meet virtually and work in new ways. Joe Alga joins us with where we are now with technological advancements. Joe? Thanks, Bree. This year, technology not only changed the way we work, but it also opened new doors for how we play and explore worlds beyond Earth. Whether it's in your pocket or blasting into space, emerging technologies have revolutionized the way we live. Last spring, a little-known software called Zoom took the global stage and changed how we learn and work. Anyone with every, any level of technology savviness will be able to use this platform. Along with other digital technologies, artificial intelligence, or AI, is a quickly growing field. AI is the ability of a computer to perform tasks usually done by humans. For example, AI is now being used to power a digital assistant on WaveNet. When you submit a question, the, the logical sense is you want the answer right away. AI can deliver that. The world of esports has seen a period of immense growth in the last decade and even found its way onto Pepperdine's campus. Really, in the past two years, there's been tremendous growth in esports at the collegiate level. So it's still fairly new as far as uh, anything sports related goes. While esports is relatively new, Ramsey said recent statistics place it at a billion dollar industry. Three, two, one. Finally, space travel has captured Americans' imaginations for over 60 years. Last month, NASA made history by piloting a remote helicopter on the surface of Mars. Even in Pepperdine's backyard, HRL Labs has had a part in developing satellite technology. We've also had some materials projects that, you know, that developing, you know, lightweight materials that might have be impactful for satellites in the long run. NASA also teamed up with SpaceX to send four astronauts to the space station on a recycled Falcon 9 rocket. As we move into the new decade, technologies like these have become parts of our everyday lives, and leaders in these fields are excited to see where the future takes us. Coming up in the second half, back on Earth, see how science is accelerating in ways that could change your daily routine even more, and also combat climate change. Thank you, Joe. We have all suffered losses over the last year from the pandemic. Smiles, in-person relationships, a normal life. But for millions in our country grieving the loss of loved ones to COVID-19, their lives truly are forever changed. These people include family, colleagues, and friends of Pepperdine Law Professor Jim McGoldrick. Current Pepperdine Law Professor Harry Caldwell met a brilliant 30-year-old man who he called Professor McGoldrick during his time as a Pepperdine Law student. I was like 25 and he was like 30. Um, So we had this young, brilliant professor. Caldwell didn't know that years later he would call him Jim. And that Jim would be more than just his professor. A family man and an avid golfer. He was just special. Everybody that knew Jim knew that he was special. And at Pepperdine, a beloved professor and respected member of the faculty. It's probably the, the best teacher, the best professor to ever pass through Pepperdine. Professor McGoldrick's wife and colleagues describe him as brilliant, funny, and compassionate. Well, Jim would always reach out to someone who felt that was maybe feeling neglected or marginalized. That's why from the moment Jim got COVID-19, the people that he cared for over the years were now all concerned about him. I must have had, I don't know, 60 or 70 people 
that and, and people kept coming on more and more. And more and they, wanted to, they wanted to know the latest on Jim's condition. While he seemed to be doing better at times, he was never fully okay. I knew he was sick, but I didn't know he was, he just was the worst case scenario. Jim McGoldrick died of complications from COVID-19 a year ago next week, just short of his 50th year teaching at Pepperdine. He was 76. Grieving during COVID is particularly hard. In the second half of the show, in a time full of so much loss, we'll see how Jim's loved ones are coping and finding meaning without their husband, father, and friend. In many ways, COVID opened up or exacerbated the issues we just covered, but now there's no way to undo what we've experienced. We must move forward and change. Black activists not backing down in the fight for racial justice. Asian Americans uniting for understanding of their experience and support. Californians pushing for a change in power and how the state handles the homeless crisis. Republicans and Democrats recognizing the Biden administration and confronting the issue of gun control to save future lives. People facing mental health head on and asking for help as people began to unmask the pain of the last year. Scientists shaping the future of how we work, interact, and even drive. Families enduring the never ending pain of losing a loved one to COVID. It is time to change. Last year, 26 million people took to the streets around the world to fight for justice. But activists say what we saw last year is just the beginning. We're all a part of the problem or we're all a part of the solution. After the past year that prompted an overdue reckoning on racism in America, Activists say everyone needs to come together. Without the uprising of 2020, right, where 26 million people around the world, right, demanded the prosecution um, of Derek Chauvin, we would not have seen the outcome that we saw. And so I think what it illustrates is the importance of people power. And that no matter who you are, anyone can organize. I think it's really important for people to recognize that it takes everyday people to organize um, and to organize everywhere that we are. Um, for Pepperdine students, it means organizing at Pepperdine. Or be a part of the fight. What I'm doing is making sure that when I show up, I show up ready. I'm prepared. I have my research. I've done my work. I'm not showing up asking someone else to teach me how to be an advocate. I believe that it is my Christian duty to fight for the freedom of Black people. And in fighting for the freedom of Black people, we ensure that all of us are free and that we can live our lives with abundance. But activists say the activism cannot let up now. Folks have started to sort of get burnt out and like turn a blind eye again, right? Or sort of just say, oh, okay, like they're taking their foot off the gas um, after just the summer erupted all over the world. And I continue to say we cannot be complacent. We have to keep going. Branch says it is time to address our racial problems once and for all. At this point, we don't have anything to lose but our chains. All activists agree that change will only come if everyone, no matter your race, comes together to dismantle and transform the system. As people start to become more aware of Asian hate crimes, Rihanna Dazon has more from two Asian American members of the Pepperdine community about what they need to feel supported. Thanks, Christina. Those people say the place to start fighting against anti-Asian bias is language. And now, Congress is taking action. With the surge of violent attacks against them, people in the Asian community say a starting point for ending the violence is stopping the use of racist language. I hope to see like the phrase, like the Chinese virus, the Kung Fu virus, all that stuff to be out of our vocabulary, out of anything in the media, um, because I think that perpetuates so much violence and that perpetuates so much prejudice. That violence and prejudice is taking a heavy toll, leaving students like junior Serena Woon fearing more attacks and pleading for understanding. Hopefully it doesn't come to the point where something like the Atlanta shooting happens again, um, where I have to ask like my teachers like, hey, can I get an extension because this really hit me hard. In an effort to combat racially motivated violence against Asian Americans, late last month, President Joe Biden signed the COVID-19 hate crimes bill. It's wrong, it's un-American, and it must 
stop. The measure will expedite the Justice Department's review of hate crimes, establish an online hate crime reporting system, coordinate organizations to raise awareness, and more. Woon says acknowledging the pain Asian Americans are facing is the first step. Asking your fellow Asian Americans how they're feeling before you ask them, hey, what can I do? Um, because I think, of course, we want to help, but it's like we're trying to one grieve whilst trying to give to others and give and help others try to understand what we're going through. You can support the Asian community by donating to Stop AAPI Hate, reporting incidents, and spreading awareness. With COVID now better under control in California, people are joining an effort to take over political control of the state. Miles Campbell reports on the state's future. Almost a full year later, Newsom finds himself facing yet another tough situation. This time, it's his job that's on the line. We're going to defeat the recall. We're going to defeat the recall. We're going to focus on getting people back to work. In efforts to vote Newsom out of office, the California Republican Party started the Recall Newsom Initiative, which garnered over 1.8 million signatures, surpassing the required amount of 1.5 million votes. Mathematically, the Trump supporting counties that didn't have as many COVID-19 cases were the ones that were most supportive of this recall. Pepperdine College Democrats President Nicholas Armenta believes the recall efforts are not based on policy or legislation, but rather to try and discredit Newsom's work. I personally think that the recall is just a Republican sham to try to take down the great work that Governor Newsom has done. I mean, they've lost almost everything. They lost the Senate. They lost the presidency. The next best thing is to take down the governor from the most powerful state in the, in the, in the union. Former Olympian and transgender activist Caitlyn Jenner announced her decision to put her name on the Republican ballot pitching herself to be a compassionate disruptor who will provide a roadmap of clarity for the state of California. I feel like our best hope to get back to a constitutional government with 18 enumerated powers um, uh, is uh, in the Republican Party. Pepperdine School of Public Policy adjunct Professor Kevin Falconer will be another candidate to face off in the race. California lawmakers will also have to adapt to having slightly less representation on a national scale. For the first time in state history, 2020 census results took away a congressional seat for the state. Means California is going to have less power federally than it did before, right? And it also means that when we're electing presidents, California will have, again, less power than it did before. Miles Campbell, Newswaves 32. California still has plenty of political clout. Even after losing one seat, California's 52-member delegation is the largest in Congress, followed by Texas, which will now have 38 seats. With the number of people living on the streets across California, and particularly Los Angeles at an all-time high, people are desperate for a solution. Two weeks ago, a federal judge ordered shelter to be offered to everyone living on Skid Row with this push to house the homeless in L.A. County. Now, the pressure is on for other cities, like Malibu, to respond. Kaylin? Thanks again, Bree. Currently, Malibu has no homeless shelter available, but they are creating a plan to build a temporary housing solution with this lot above City Hall as a possible location to help transition individuals into other housing solutions. One of the things we're looking at is an alternate living situation modeled after one that we saw in Laguna Beach. Laguna Beach has similar issues, geography, uh, to Malibu, and it's working for them. I believe in the two years since the enrollment program started, we've housed around 80 or so people. Originally, it started in 2009 people experiencing homelessness were being ticketed for sleeping on the beach and things like that, but the city did not provide an alternative sleeping location for them. They got sued by the ACLU, um, I believe, and then the whole shelter system started. So we have showers, we have three bathrooms, we have laundry on site, we have computers for clients to use, we have telephones as well. A lot of people don't have cell phones. We do three meals a day. We have housing coordinators here. They will get them connected to clothing resources, um, employment training programs, things like that, and then helping with the housing search. The location I think is the best is the upper parking lot of City Hall. And you could actually squeeze in, I think up to like five mobile home trailers and put them together and build a facility there very easily. 
I think it'd be a good idea. We need somewhere to go. They keep chasing us out, getting, you know, trespassing us, taking us to jail over just trying to crash for the night. Um, yeah, it's ridiculous. We do need a place to go. Bree, I talked to one of the Malibu ASL consultants, Alex Gittinger, who said that a lot of the homeless solutions that are coming out seem to be like people throwing spaghetti at the walls and hoping something sticks. So I hope this temporary housing solution is one of those solutions that does stick to help transition people into other forms of housing if they want it. Thank you, Kaylin. Thank you, Kaylin and Bree. At the national level, President Biden is now past his first 100 days in office and has set the foundation for his presidency. Democrats are excited for a diverse future. But, as Christian Parham reports, conservatives still need a lot to change. Looking forward, what's next for President Biden? He's faced unprecedented levels of division within the country. On the conservative side, meet Damon Malaska, a freshman at Northern Oklahoma College who gained nearly 200,000 TikTok followers through posting about his views. He sometimes struggles to accept the results of the 2020 election. There needs to be a voter ID for sure. You need to be able to go in person and you need to sit there and you need to vote. Malaska even goes as far to suggest that voters should be required to be evaluated before being able to vote. Um, every few years, I think you need to be able to take like a test to be able to vote, like common sense test. He argues that the unification of America begins with mainstream media. We need to uh, censor um, like the news networks because they're out here saying not the, they're not giving the full story. He recognizes, like countless Americans, that unity is desperately needed. One big reason why America is America, because people should be able to sit down with each other and have a civil conversation. Paris Denard, head of Black Affairs for the Republican Party, argues that Biden and the Democrats are responsible for continuing division. I think what you see is the American people going to, are going to be able to see that the Biden administration is too extreme for where Americans are. However, members of the Democratic Party, including Los Angeles County Democrats Executive Director Drexel Hurd, sees Biden as promoting change. Uh, a, 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 a diverse present leadership is going to give us the roadmap that we need uh, to remind the American people that the future is also diverse. Hurd believes that Biden has the power to influence the course of generations to come. We're stepping in sync. You know, you've got progress plus recovery, progress plus recovery. And I think that's what we're going to continue to see through this Biden administration. While Biden has energized Democrats, it's clear divisions are still deep. Christian Parham, Newswaves 32. Kurt says he is especially excited about achieving social justice and equity through politics. In a year marked by deep divisions, recent mass shootings have led to greater consciousness about an issue that always divides people, gun control. Did this year push us to the point of finally experiencing enough for change? Organizations such as the Brady Campaign are actively working across party lines to end gun violence. Organizations and politicians and like advocates have switched their messaging from gun control to gun violence prevention because at this point, gun control is so polarizing. A national survey conducted this month found that while almost 75% of Democrats consider gun violence to be a very big problem for the country, only 18% of Republicans say the same. We know that the support is there. Um, our problem now is how we frame it. Some gun policy proposals, such as background checks, do seem to have bipartisan support. We know that uh, background checks have over 90% support um, in most polls, and we know that uh, puppies don't even get 90% in most polls from people. President Biden has already signed six executive orders concerning gun reform. So these executive orders, which range from ghost guns to um, all other things, uh, are just kind of taking small pieces of this rarely large problem um, and trying to address them one on one. Some, like Pepperdine class of 2020 and current law student Justin Rorick, are more weary of gun laws. If people just looked into it like the red flag law, everyone agrees, but They'll never pass anything because it's either too far left and it infringes on your right or it's too far right and it doesn't do enough to control it. He also acknowledges that the current system could be improved. The problem with the system right now is it's not sufficient. It's just a self 
Background check. Unfortunately, data shows that partisan gaps are getting wider. GOP support for an assault weapons ban has dropped nearly 20 percent in recent years. Oh, why does anyone need this weapon of war, right? Well, people use it for hunting. It's just this thing that, like, you're chipping away at the Second Amendment. Organizations like Brady are prepared for these conversations. It's instead of creating one bill that we think is going to solve all of gun violence, we've broken it up into different bills um, so that we can make incremental change and so that it makes the negotiations a little bit easier. Two issues the Biden administration have targeted include unregistered weapons known as ghost guns and red flag laws, which allows law enforcement to take guns from people deemed dangerous. As the prospect of post-COVID life becomes more tangible, Abby Will joins us with why mental health experts say the next few months are crucial. Abby? Yes, as we all experienced mental health challenges this year, a therapist I interviewed says we must learn from them in order to heal. As the U.S. opens up again, people are starting to feel more optimistic and appreciative for emotional struggles COVID taught them. I will for sure learn and grow from the fact that I've experienced, like, extreme loneliness this past year. With everyone experiencing some of the same feelings. For a long time, I don't think there's anything that we've all collectively all gone through. So somewhat it brings us together. People are also more open to talk about their mental health struggles. I think it's definitely being talked about more just over the past few years and becoming more acceptable to talk about, which is great. It's not just being talked about more. People are recognizing that they need help and seeking it from professionals. Therapists in Malibu and across the country are booked out for months in advance and unable to accommodate everyone seeking help. I mean, I've been doing this for over 20 years and I've never seen such a surge of clients in my life. As there is reason for optimism as life starts to return to normal, people are left reflecting on where their mental health has been in the past year and how they are going to heal together now. These next few months are a crucial time that we we kind of, we really do think through, what are the lessons? What is it we want to take? What is it we want to let go of? The next few months will be a time of healing for us all. Dr. Schultz says it will be important to give each other grace as we slowly enter back into the world. Back to you, Christina. As people get vaccinated and cases plunge, the end of the pandemic finally seems to be in sight. But for many, as Christina Burovtova and Tanya Yarian report, the return to normal social activities won't be easy. I wouldn't dream of going to the grocery store and touching the handle of the cart without sanitizing. So I definitely think that some of those practices will continue and move forward. Adjunct professor of sociology Emily Plank says some common health practices that people adopted during the pandemic might be here to stay. Some students, like Rufus Florin, think mask wearing is one of the practices that will continue to protect us, not only from COVID. Because there is like an element of protection and sanitariness, I guess, against other sort of viruses or diseases as well. And some people might even see it as like a fashion trend. As cases in California continue to trend down, visiting professor of psychology Jessica Kale says for all places, vaccinations will be the fastest way to get things back to normal. The other advantage of getting people vaccinated as quickly as possible is we could stop these variants because it'll stop the variants from being able to jump. Even though vaccines are rolling out, it is hard to predict what is next and when we will be past the pandemic. In the meantime, Plink says it will be normal for people to feel anxious about reacclimating into society. I think there's going to be this weird phase. I don't know how long it will last, months, a couple of years, just after the initial pandemic, where the, 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 the felt memory of the pandemic is so acute. And after more than a year of COVID routines, a return to normal is not going to feel normal for many. It's going to feel very weird to be in a grocery store and not have a mask on, or it's going to be very weird to sit um, on an airplane and be so close to other people, even if you still have a mask on. Tanya Arian, Newswaves 32. Experts say it might be best to engage in smaller gatherings first. And if you're nervous, let others know how you're feeling. After a year with technology that changed us and saved us, as Joe Allgood reports with scientists in the driver's seat, it seems there really is no limit to what is next. 
After most of America's workforce switched to telecommuting over a year ago, employers and employees alike are now considering the viability of a virtual format. At the very minimum, the hybrid format that you were mentioning, that there will be a lot more people working, choosing to work from home more days. Telecommuting from home means that fewer workers would be commuting on the roads. But even so, the automotive industry is looking expectantly to the future of self-driving cars. Although slow to develop, the chief scientific officer at HRL Labs says car companies will be hitting the gas pedal in this area. There are, all, there are different levels for autonomy. They're actually well-defined. You know, uh, I think the ultimate goal is level five autonomy, where the, the vehicle drives without human intervention. But Chow says that level of true self-driving cars is still a long way off. Along with the automotive industry, many are working to convert the world to clean energy in the fight against climate change. There are some exciting things happening, believe it or not, in nuclear energy. And people that used to be very, very, very opposed to it, it's a very clean source of energy. Brewster says that smaller nuclear reactors are making it safer and more feasible to produce nuclear energy. All in all, it seems that artificial intelligence may become one of the most influential new technologies as it has a vast multitude of applications from the road to the sky. Self-driving cars, that's already happening. We're already seeing NASA controlling, doing flight simulations, uh, conducting flights over in another planet. The same AI tools may one day become available to everyone and fit right into your back pocket. Joe Allgood, Newswaves 32. For people who lost loved ones to COVID, as life slowly returns to normal, all they know is that there will be more tears. As vaccines roll out and there's a glimmer of hope that life will safely shift back to normal in the coming months, so many people like Jan McGoldrick, who lost her husband, Jim, to COVID-19 last May, are still working on their grief and it won't disappear like the virus. It's been very, very hard on his children, very hard. I mean, they were, the dad was everything. With over 570,000 COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. alone, so many people are sensing holes in their lives right now. Not having your best friend around anymore is, is, leaves a huge hole in your life. And the pain of losing a loved one might actually get worse when life appears to return to normal. Stephen Schultz, who taught with his best friend Jim for 16 years at the Pepperdine Law School, says he's not ready for the day when he has to go back to campus without him. That's going to be incredibly hard. I know I'm going to shed tears that day. The impact of all deaths is powerful. Grief experts say that for those grieving someone who died during the pandemic, one of the best ways to honor that grief is by remembering the lives of those who have died. Schultz plans to do just that for his friend Jim. Tomorrow's my last day of classes, um, and I will end classes the way I have since Jim passed which is with the Jim farewell kiss, which is. I will continue to do that even with students in the future who won't know him. For millions, COVID changed them by forcing them to live with loss. But through honoring their loved ones, joy can return. For Newswaves 32, I'm TJ Barnholtz. I'm Christina Stratton. And I'm Brianna Willis. From all that we have experienced and seen over the past year, as life does return to normal in the ways that we have shown, there really is no going back. We thank you for watching this special edition of Newswaves.